There's only a couple of people in the media I trust. One of them joins us right now, Laura Ingram, guest ready. Her book, Billionaire at the Barricades. Laura, what's going on in the book row? Oh, hey, Michael. Good to talk to you. How's everything going there? Horrible. I'm in a horrible mood as usual. It's Friday, oh. and, and I, I don't know, like I got a bad neck, something. I, so, Laura, how's the book tour going? It's good. I had to cut it short because of uh, this new show I'm doing on Fox on Monday. But, yeah, we, we, uh, we hit, I think, number eight in the New York Times list. But you've got to keep it going, Michael, because you've got a lot of liberals on the list, as you know. Now, what is your book, Billionaire at the Barricades, and why should anyone read it? It is a... Hello? Oh, we lost her, right? That was nice. Bingo. That was probably, she's probably in a tunnel somewhere in the CIA. I don't know where she is. Clint, okay, well, she'll call us back. That's all. We're waiting for Laura to call back. Apparently her, lo her line broke, right, Cliff? She went in a tunnel or something? The tunnel of love? Is she back or not? Just what, what are you shaking your hands through the screen? Yes or no? I don't know. I'm looking through the screen. Yes? Where is she? Line who? Where is she? I don't know. See, I'm, I'm not getting the right signaling here. Oh, Ingram, Ingram, Ingram. Line 10, Ingram. Laura, you're back. You went through the tunnel of love. You're back? It's, it's, it's another assault against the populist movement. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the NSA did it. I know, right? A big secret. Now, it's, you're probably walking through a tunnel into CIA headquarters, right? Oh, my, oh my God. It's a nightmare. Are you going to be in Florida over Thanksgiving? <laughs> Why? Who's there? Well, I'm going to be, so I was thinking we could have dinner. <laughs> Let's just talk. Are we, gonna go to, are we going to Mar-a-Lago? Well, I'm not a member of Mar-a-Lago, but we could go somewhere. Well, no, but is the president inviting us for his Thanksgiving dinner? No, I have no idea. I'm not, I'm, I'm, ta I'm rather, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in seeing you and your family. <laughs> <laughs> me, me more than President Trump. Yeah. Because at least, yeah, because at least I have a drink, he doesn't. Well, I, I think for him it's, uh, it's a good thing and... It is a very good thing. For me it would kill me if I didn't drink. If I didn't have a drink I'd be dead. <laughs> I can't drink really much anymore. I've decided it just doesn't doesn't work with me. I'm 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 pretty much not. Yeah, you're going into a high gear. Monday is the big day, huh? Yeah. So it's uh I uh, Nora, Laura, come on, be honest with my audience. A little a little butterflyish over Monday? Oh yeah. Oh, of course. This is kind of the biggest but you have been on Fox for how many years now? You used to fill in for a man whose name I'm not allowed to mention because of what happened. Ten. Ten years. Ten years? So what's the big deal? So you're going to go for... You did fill-ins for a whole show, right? Yeah, but filling in for someone is different from having... You, you know, your, your name on the show, your, you know, it's your team, it's your booking, it's your, your effort, it's your monologue, it's your, you know, so... Yeah, it's... I know, it's a big pressure. And how many children do you have to deal with? Three. That's all. Three children, new house, new career. What more could you ask for? Yeah, well, and my friends. And you're, you know what? My family are my friends. So you're my family. Well, you, you, you have faith. Don't you have faith? I mean, you're very religious, aren't you, without going into it? I'm very religious. I'm a fallen person, Michael. I'm a fallen fallen. Well, person. you're a fallen angel like all of us, but you are a very, very faithful person. You, are, you believe in God, don't you? I get down on my knees every night and I pray for wisdom and humility and patience because I'm very impatient, extremely. It's my worst, one of my worst faults. Well, all of us in the media have a Lawrence O'Donnell moment. Yeah. So, <laughs> just, I need to take a... I mean, but he heard hammering in his head. <laughs> Stop the hammering! Stop the hammering! Who's hammering up there? Who's hammering? Who's hammering? I'll come up there myself! Who's hammering? Let me tell you, I empathize with anyone who goes through, like, a live broadcast and stuff just doesn't work. I mean, until, you know this, Michael, until it's your show with a microphone and the light goes on and then it's just, you know, it's, it's easier said that, oh, keep your cool. Yeah, okay, yeah, you should keep your cool, but sometimes it's not easy. All right, don't worry about it. So you got a hot temper, so what? That's what makes you great. No. Well, you don't look, Laura. My advice to you, and I'm not in television. It's a tough medium, television, because radio, as tough as it can be, especially in the loose format in which I do it, which is free form, uh, television is so different. Where every gesture, every grimace, every blink is seen. I know it's a different. It's a different stress. Well, also for women, you know, I'm like I'm like a tomboy, so I I wear jeans and a, and a t-shirt, and like I like to dress up, but. 
I'm much more of kind of an outdoors person, athlete, and so the whole hair and makeup thing, it's just not me. So is that... Why don't you do your show in a t-shirt and jeans? I might. I might. Nothing. What if one day, what if one, like every Friday you did a show as you really are, what would happen then? They, Fox would go crazy. People would flee the TV, that's what would happen. They'd be like... <laughs> Who is well, it? it's a tough, it's a tough business. So, Laura, on the book tour again, getting back to your book, a billionaire at the barricades. What's happening out in the bookstores? Well, I think that uh, right now, because there's been such a um, contraction of bookstores and independent bookstores are under such pressure, it's definitely harder for most authors if you don't have a platform. Like you have a huge platform, your book's coming. Out. By the way, I just got your book today. I'm so excited. I can't oh, thank it. God they mailed it. I was shocked at the... Oh, good. Just got it. Literally just got it. Um, don't, wait, 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 hold it. What do you think I look... How do I look on the cover? You look great. It's a great don't I have like a Norman Vincent Peale look, like very saintly, like my eyes like cut oh, right through you? It's a great... No, no, no. It's a great picture of you. You look great. I love it. Is that me? But is that the real me, or is there a different me that you see? You don't really think of me as that, with that serene guy with like guru-like eyes, do you? Um... I think of you as a as a storyteller, a room you, you, who ruminates. You ruminate a lot over things. That's kind of an insult. I'm not. A, I don't have any bovine in me. No, you you, you reflect and ruminate, and, <laughs> and you tell stories. It's a lost art in the United States. But anyway, back. I know. To no, I'm just kidding. But so, Laura, honestly, tell me what's going on. So, because the bookstores are contracting. Yeah. Uh, it, well, we lost Borders Books a few years ago. That was a huge loss for authors, right? Noble shutting down everywhere across the country. They're, they're still there, but they're very they're much fewer. Uh, and Books a Million still is out there. But, you know, independent bookstores, you know, they can't compete with Amazon. It's really hard for them. So I always, I do try to support independent stores. And conservative books are, are you know, routinely, routinely shunned. By books yeah, but things. Laura, I got to tell you, my books last five in a row are bestsellers. They're all in, in um, heavy, heavy placement in Barnes and Noble up front, heavy in in uh, Books a Million, heavy in in Sam's Club, and it's because my publisher, frankly, works at it to make it happen. I mean, I'm not complaining about your publisher or putting them down, yep. but uh, yes, it's a competitive world, the, the retail world. But one third of all books today are sold on uh, digitally, aren't they? They're like you know the the digital. <laughs> a little less than it used to be but yeah i think there's still a lot and amazon is just crushing everybody so amazon and and, and the new york times list doesn't really count amazon they count amazon i think a third as much as they count an independent book sale so oh they they modify so if, if your book's number one on amazon they don't count all the numbers they, it's not it's not weighted the same Oh, my God. You know, but Laura, listen, this is an important conversation for young people listening or people who want to write a book. Everyone wants to write a book. Everyone thinks they have a book in them. And I started as an unknown poet, you know, short story writer. And, you know, if I had thought that I could sell 10,000 copies in hardcover of one of my early writings, I would have thought I was a huge success. The pressure on us today is so overwhelming that unless you sell 150,000 in hardcover, you're a failure. It's, it's a nightmare. Oh my God! No, it's not just that. Like, in, in unless you have a platform, like a real platform to sell a, sell a book, good luck. I mean, it's just it's rare. It's just like in the music industry. It's it's rare to have a break art breakout uh, author now. It's just it's it's really hard. So you have to have a platform like you. But your book did well. It went up to number eight, right? Yeah. Well, it just came out. I mean, it's, and, I'm, and now that I'm on television, you know, we'll be able to. We'll be able to oh, so you're going you're gonna to be able to talk about your own book on your own show. That's great. Yeah, well, you know, most people don't most people don't know that I was a speechwriter in the Reagan administration. Most people don't know that I was a total rabble rouser at Dartmouth College when when people didn't even call it political correctness. You know, they don't know that I came from extremely humble beginnings and had you know had had the upbringing I had. Most people think that I'm some blue blood. No, everyone, if I looked at you, I thought you were like a rich white girl. You had white privilege. I mean, the minute I met you, I thought you were white privilege. No, I had Polish privilege. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't help it. You know the joke, right? No, exactly. Yeah, well, I had no privilege. I've had a fight for everything I ever, I ever had. So, Laura, you're a fighter. You know, I, I don't want to dwell on it, but people should know, Laura, as a human being, can can you mention? No, that wouldn't be right for me to bring up. But you've overcome a physical problem. I think it's worth talking about so people know what you're fighting, how hard it is. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I had breast cancer back in 2005. I was actually, um, I actually got found out I had it because I was engaged and we were, you know, wanted to have kids right away. And I went to the doctor and the doctor's like, well, I feel a little something. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> and so then I went to get it looked at and this woman said, well, I think it's okay. We can just monitor it every six months. And another doctor said, nah, uh, uh, I want that biopsy right away. And of course, I got a biopsy, and I got a call the next day. Um, you do have breast cancer. I'm like, oh, thanks. I'm glad I had another opinion. So, oh, I'm sorry I'll to hear it. And yeah, well, you had a you had a you had a double surgery, Laura, and you overcame all that. And you're on the on the radio all these years. And now you're on TV. I mean, it's a tough, a tough, uh, a tough road you're going down. You know. Well, on on Thursday, I I would I would finish my show on Thursday at noon, and then I would run to the hospital to do chemotherapy and then the next day oh. I was totally out of it and then I'd come back by Monday. Oh my god, you're tough as nails. Laura, stay <laughs> stay on the line. I know we were only going to do one segment, but every time you get on my show, we have such a great rapport. We're like the uh, Burns and Allen of our generation. Uh, oh when we come back, god. we're going to no, we I mean, well, we're better than them. We are going to talk about Laura Ingham's book Billionaire at the Barricades and hopefully I want to hear what she thinks about God, faith and reason the minute we come back on the Savage Nation. Now let's go back to our wonderful guest, Laura Ingram, with her new book, Billionaire at the Barricades. Laura, fire away. You have a minute to tell the world about your book. The country is at a crossroads. We say it, you know, every four years, it's at a crossroads. But given the fact that now we have people who think it's okay to kneel for the national anthem, that we're bending gender that we're spending like there's no tomorrow, that China has the largest standing army in the world. We have to understand how to beat this establishment, beat the bipartisan cabal in Washington. We're on our way with Trump, but we've got to hold him accountable. So we have to understand where we've been to be able to be sure that we're going to be successful as a country. And, and uh, we have to have fun as we launch this war against the cabal. And I, I take you every step of the way for the last 20 years on this journey. And I lay out how Trump can actually be successful. And he listens to people like Savage and yours truly and stays on message and stays on principle. We're going to see a renaissance in this country like we haven't seen since 1980. So. All right. So and the way to do it is read your book, Billionaire at the Barricades, to learn all about it. Laura Ingram, again, I wish you the best of success on Monday. And hopefully you know what might happen. You, mm, we're might be the you might be the lucky one to get me back on television after 20 years of an absence, Laura. Oh, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't wait. I'm working to make that happen. And Michael, you're just such a great friend and such a great person and patriot, and I just I adore you. You know that. All right. Well, good luck, and cut down on the stress. Have a drink on me. This is the Savage Nation. If we are a free nation, why are we enslaved by drugs and pornography and other addictions? Are we really free? How do you solve the opioid problem? Huh? Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel.